Okay, now let's just do a little bit more with this example, uh, and then we'll go on to uh, work out a couple of results, a couple of theorems about, uh, about the span um, uh, and sets of linear combinations. So let's extend this example just a little bit more by adding one more vector. Let's say one more state-dependent returns vector. We'll call it R3. And so let's let that be, that would be R31, R32, and let's let that be uh, 2 and minus 1. And so, of course, L, uh, and let me, let me refer to that, the set consisting of that one vector, as, uh, just like we had before, as S3 will be the set consisting of just R3, and of course, L of S3, uh, well, I won't write down what it is, but we know it's going to be all the multiples of the vector 2, 1, and so, or 2 minus 1. So 2 minus 1 would be about here, and all the multiples of that would be the line coming through here. So this would be L of S3, this would be R3. Things are getting a little bit crowded up here. Uh, but the main thing I want to notice, the main thing for introducing this uh, third vector here is that, of course, everything in, uh, everything in L of S3 is something that I could already obtain with the first two vectors I had, R1 and R2. So if, if this is a new security that's introduced, it's not providing us with any additional uh, state-dependent possibilities beyond what we could already get with the first two uh, state-dependent returns vectors, if you like the first two securities. Uh, and we can see that by saying, let's define S sub 1, 2, 3, just to give it a, a very descriptive name, as the set consisting of the three state-dependent returns vectors, R1, R2, and R3, and then, of course, L of S, 1, 2, 3, is still just R2. The point here being that adding this additional vector gave us nothing new. It can't give us anything more because we're already getting all of R2 with the first two vectors, the first two securities. So this additional security is fine, doesn't hurt anything, but it doesn't give us anything that we couldn't already obtain with the first two vectors. And of course, it's also clear that we could have used R1 and R3 to generate all of R2, or R2 and R3. Any two of these three vectors would have worked just as well. And that's, of course, because any two of them span all of R2. And let's just note one more thing before we abandon this example, and that is, uh, it's connected with what we've already said, and that is that R3, as we said, can be obtained um, as a linear combination of R1 and R2, and in fact, it is just R1 minus R2. So it's just R1 minus R2, giving me 2 for the first component, minus 1 for the second component, and, of course, that's a linear combination with the scalar being 1 and the scalar being minus 1. So the fact that we can obtain that state-dependent ve returns vector, that vector, as a linear combination, again, just tells us that R3 was already in L of S12. And let's note that we could also have written this as R1 minus R2 minus R3 is the zero vector by just pulling R3 over to this side, giving us the zero vector here, and then we have this, and that this is related to the idea that these three vectors are linearly dependent, something we're going to develop more in the next lecture. Uh, so these three vectors are linearly dependent, 
And I just mentioned a moment ago that any two of the three vectors we have are linearly independent. And that just uh, reflects the fact that we can't do this, we can't get the zero vector as a linear combination, a non-trivial linear combination of any two of the vectors. So that's someplace that we're going next, but next lecture, but not today. So that kind of takes care of our example. Um, I'm going to come back and say a little bit more about the application in this example uh, at the end of the lecture today. But now let's go on to develop uh, a couple of results about um, the span of a set of vectors. So here we have a theorem that says for any subset of a vector space, S, any subset S, the set of linear combinations, the span of that set S, is a subspace. And so I should have said before actually putting the theorem up here, that I should have pointed out that everything that we've done so far in the example, every one of the uh, spans, the span of S1, this line, the span of S2, this line, the span of S3, this line, the span of S12, all of R2, the span of S123, all of R2. Every one of those spans, L of some S, appears to be a subspace. It looks like a subspace. It walks like a subspace. It talks like a subspace, so it probably is a subspace. Uh, it seems to be linear, and in each case seems to contain the zero vector. And so this theorem, I should have done that before putting the theorem up here, this theorem um, tells us that indeed uh, any, for any set S, the set of linear combinations, the span, is indeed going to be a vector subspace. And we call it the space spanned by or generated by the set. So this would be the set, uh, this would be the subspace spanned by the set S1. This is the subspace spanned by S2, and R2 is the subspace of R2, spanned by S12, but it's also spanned by uh, S123. And so, uh, as I say, we also call it the subspace generated by that set. So, uh, what we want to do now is we want to see if we can prove this theorem. So, let me start the proof by, uh, so let's put over here, we're going to try to prove this theorem. Let's start the proof by saying, uh, first, suppose that S is the empty set, right? So if S is the empty set, uh, then L of S is the set consisting of the zero vector. So let's say, if S is the empty set, then according to our definition of L of this S, we have L of, uh, of S is the singleton consisting of the zero vector, which, of course, is a vector subspace of, uh, of, our t of, of, of any vector space. It's always the case that the zero vector is a singleton, kind of degenerate, vector subspace of the vector space it lives in. And so now let's continue the proof by saying, therefore, let's uh, uh, assume that S now is non-empty. And I'm going to replace this, uh, this marker here. And uh, if S is non-empty, then what do we have to do to prove that the set L of S is a subspace? I have to prove it's a vector space in its own right. I have to prove V1 through V8. But remember, we've already shown that once we have a non-empty set, that is, uh, yeah, once we have a non-empty set, then 
in order to show that that set is a vector space, all we need to do is establish V1 and V2. So let's see if we can do that. So we need to establish V1 and V2 for the set L of S. So we're going to start with uh, establishing V2 because that's a little more straightforward. So for V2, let's say what we need to establish is that uh, lambda in R and let's say X in um, L of S implies lambda X is in L of S. So that's what we need to show. And so let's uh, note that assuming this is saying that X is, X is in the span, X is a linear combination of vectors in S. So that says that X equals alpha 1, um, let's just say V1, plus out to alpha N, Vn uh, for V1 to Vn in S. And of course, for alphas that are scalars, I won't write that down, but the alphas, for some scalars, the alphas. So if X is this linear combination of vectors in S, then what's lambda X? Lambda X then is lambda times alpha 1 V1 out to alpha n Vn, but that's just lambda alpha 1 V1 plus lambda alpha n Vn. And so uh, clearly each of these is a scalar. The alpha 1's a scalar, lambda times alpha 1's a scalar. So each of these is a scalar. So this is a linear combination of, uh, it's still a linear combination, a different linear combination than the one we started with. Of course, it's a multiple of it. It's a linear combination of V1 to Vn in S i.e. Uh, lambda x is in L of S. So this establishes V2, that if we start out with a vector in the span here, that's a linear combination of vectors in S, then any scalar multiple of that vector will also be a linear combination of vectors in S, and therefore lambda x will be in in the span here. And so now uh, we want to do V1, and it's clear that we don't have a lot of space to do that. So I think what we will do is take off everything over here, and then we'll uh, prove uh, that V1 holds for L of S over here. So uh, we'll take a moment to take this off, and we'll be right back. Okay, we're back. We've got some space to work with here, and uh, let's now see if we can uh, verify V1 for the set L of S. So that we'll show that L of S is indeed a subspace. So let's say we're going to try to prove that V1 holds. And of course, V1 is that uh, X, Y in L of S implies that X plus Y is in L of S. That is, L of S is closed under, uh, under uh, vector addition. So from this, we have X equals alpha 1 V1 to alpha N Vn. And Y is also a linear combination of vectors in S. But of course, not the same scalars and not the same vectors. So let's use beta 1 w1 out to beta, and of course not necessarily the same number of vectors in the linear combination, so wm, where the uh, alphas and the betas are all 
scalars and the v's and the w's are all in s. Let me emphasize that, not L of s, but s, okay? And so if that's the case, then what's x plus y? Then x plus y is just alpha 1 v1 to alpha n v n plus beta 1 w1 out to beta m w m. And so x plus y is a linear combination of vectors in S because all the V's and all the W's are vectors in S. All the alphas and betas are scalars. So x plus y is a linear combination of vectors in S. And that really completes the proof because uh, we can say this is a linear combination of, let's just say, of vectors in S. And so, uh, therefore, x plus y is in the set of all linear combinations of vectors in S, the span of S, and that completes the proof. I could almost have squeezed that in down here, probably. Uh, let's just point out a couple of things, though, here. Um, one is that uh, in each of these cases, it was an important point that there's only a finite number of vectors in a linear combination. This is particularly germane here because we have n, whoops, it was supposed to be an m here. <laughs> it was a mistake. So there's n vectors uh, comprising x and m vectors comprising y. And when we add those two numbers together, we still get a number n plus m that is a finite, finite number, a finite collection of vectors. And we should also then, as a second uh, point, point out that the actual number of vectors is no larger than n plus m. It could be smaller because, of course, it's possible here that uh, one of the vectors vi is equal to one of the vectors wj. And if that's the case, then uh, alpha i vi plus beta j wj, the sum of those two terms in the linear combination is just alpha i plus beta j times, say, vi. And so, of course, now you could say, well, hey, what happened to the beta j wj here on the right-hand side? And, of course, if vi is equal to wj, then um, I've got over here alpha i vi plus beta j wj, but wj is equal to vi. And so what's happening here, of course, is that uh, we could have any number of the terms collapsing into one, into just one term, uh, because we could have the same, the same vectors show up as both a v and a w. But that's not a problem. It reduces the number of vectors that are going to the linear combination, but it's still a linear combination of vectors in S, so X plus, so we still have L of S closed under vector addition. So, so this gives us uh, our theorem, a, an important theorem. I'll come back and say a few words about uh, at the end of the lecture here. Um, that uh, L of S is not only the set uh, spanned by the set S, it's the subspace spanned by the set S because it's always a vector subspace. Now let's just finish off with one more result. And for that, we're going to have to take off uh, some of the material here. So we'll take off, actually, I think we'll take off everything and we will do one more result. Okay, so you notice that I've put our diagram uh, back on the screen here because I want to refer to that for this last result that we have. So this last result is this theorem that says that the span of a set of vectors, span of a set S of vectors, is the smallest subspace that contains S. And then there's two alternative ways of saying the same thing here. I'll just say them quickly, but then I'll come back and say something about them again. One is that the 
uh, the span in all of S is a subset of every subspace that contains S, and that it's also the intersection of all the subspaces that contain S. So those are just three equivalent statements. And so let's use our um, diagram over here to kind of get a better idea of what this theorem is saying. So let's take the set S1 consisting of just the uh, R1 vector. So we get, um, we get L of S1 is a subspace which is the line through R1. And so this theorem tells us that that is the smallest subspace containing R1, containing the set capital S1, the smallest. And you can see intuitively that it clearly is because the only smaller subspace is the, is the subspace consisting of just the zero vector. So it, intuitively, it clearly is the smallest subspace containing S1, that is the smallest subset uh, subspace containing the vector R1, and the same for the other two vectors R2 and R3. The associated span is the smallest subspace of R2 containing the vector, in each case a line, and of course then once we go to the two vectors R1 and R2, and if that's our set S2, then the smallest subspace containing just those two vectors but I have to have a subspace. The smallest subspace containing those two vectors is the subspace that's all of R2. And that the only smaller subspaces are lines. And there's no line that contains both the vectors R1 and R2. So uh, that gives you a better feel, I think, for the, what this theorem is saying, that the span is the smallest subspace containing the underlying set S that generates it. And you can also see that the if I look at any subspace that contains uh, S1, just the line through R1, if you look at any of the subspaces that contain that, well, there's only two, the line and all of R2, and L of S is uh, a subset of both of those subspaces. It is one of the subspaces, and it's a subset, a subspace, in fact, of the other subspace. And again, you can see that it's the intersection of all the subspaces that contain it. And there may be a good example, since we're just stuck here in R2, is the zero vector alone. So the zero vector alone is the intersection of all the subspaces that contain just the zero vector. Uh, and that would be all of the subspaces. All the subspaces there are contain the zero vector. The intersection of all those subspaces is just the zero vector. And that is the smallest of all subspaces. So this lecture's starting to go a little long. I'm sure you've noticed that uh, that's a penchant that I have for um, making these lectures go a little longer than I intend. So this lecture is starting to run a little bit long. So I, for this theorem, instead of me proving it for you on the screen, I am going to suggest that you prove this theorem as an exercise. And so the last thing I want to say here uh, in today's lecture is I want to come back to the theorem at the top here that says that uh, for any set, the set of all linear combinations is a vector subspace. So what I want to do is I want to use that to talk about our application to uh, financial economics, to the economics of uncertainty. And this theorem is the foundation of a central result in the economics of uncertainty in financial economics. And that result is that the set of securities that we have and the corresponding set of state-dependent returns vectors, which in our example we only had three, R1, R2, and R3, uh, and we were always in R2 where there were just two possible 
states of the world, but more generally, we could be in a larger dimensional uh, Euclidean space, R, L, let's say, and we could have any number of different securities, each one giving us a state-dependent vector in R, L, let's say, and uh, what this theorem tells us is that all of the z vectors, all of the state-dependent returns that an investor or even an economy can achieve with just those securities is this subspace L of S generated by the securities. So once we have that set of securities identified, then L of S for that set S of securities is all the state-dependent returns that we can possibly achieve via markets and prices, via markets for securities. Now, we might be able to achieve other state-dependent returns vectors by some other means, not using markets. But with these securities that we have, L of S, the subspace spanned by those securities or generated by the securities, that's the set of all state-dependent returns that we can achieve. And so uh, we might want to expand the set of state-dependent returns we can achieve by perhaps expanding the set of securities there are. And in fact, that is the idea that underlies the financial innovation that took place in especially the American economy, but basically the world economy, over the preceding 20 to 25 years, the idea behind the financial innovation was expanding the set of state-dependent returns that we can achieve via markets for securities by expanding the kinds of securities that there are. And that, that, is, that basically is a description of uh, the financial innovation that we've seen over the preceding 20, 25 years. And so you can see then uh, the centrality of linear combinations, uh, the idea of the span or the subspace generated by um, a set of vectors and how that is central to a lot of what we do in micro and even macro economics. So that's it for today's lecture. Uh, next time, we'll begin to talk about linear independence, linear dependence, the notion of a basis and dimension. Uh, but that's for next time. Uh, so see you all next time.